Welcome everybody, in this video we're going to build a clone of Automapper, a popular .NET library that maps one type to another. It is going to be a simple implementation so you can get your head around how it works and how to build this sort of thing. It is important to know that you can build these frameworks so you're never held hostage by them or if you get creative ideas you actually know how to create these. Now there will be a couple of additional videos, uh, same topic where we're going to create Automapper, but we're going to use different approaches. We're going to take IL emission and source code generation, and we're going to compare the three solutions, uh, how they stack up against each other, pros and cons, etc. So if you don't want to miss those videos, go ahead and subscribe. We got quite a bit to cover. Let's go ahead and get stuck in. So uh, we have a class, I'll just call it A and I'll give it some um, uh, easy properties like uh, ID and name, right? So we don't need too much. I'll then just make a copy of the class. I'll make it something like B. So I got two types, A and B. I might have even more types, like a gazillion ones. I don't wanna be able to write functions for all possible combinations between those types. This is where Automapper comes in. So what we want to do is specifically see how the conversion of one to another will look in the expression API. So let's go ahead, bring up an expression with a function where we supply an A and get a B in the end, right? So this is going to be an expression where we supply an A and then on the end, we get a B. And all we are really doing is we're just mapping the identifier or the properties of one to the other. Finally, we have our expression. Let's go ahead and dump it. I'm going to run this. And here we essentially have a blueprint for how this is going to look like. So we're gonna start from the top node and slowly traverse into lower ones and well, build up a skeleton for a expression that is gonna perform the conversion. So starting with the Lambda function, we're gonna go into expression. We're gonna go to Lambda and we're gonna take a look at the parameters that we need for Lambda. We have the expression for the body, we have tail call and then we have the parameters. So one parameter of type A here, a tail call is false, and then the body is the new expression. So let's type this out, body, tail call is false, and parameters, uh, I'll just supply the one parameter, I'm pretty sure there is an overload where I can supply many objects. So for the parameter, uh, this is a parameter expression, again, I'm just going to go to the expression uh, class and bring up my parameter, which is of type A, okay. So I'm going to make these types hard coded. I'm just going to repeat myself quite a bit just because I'm building this up. So let's create this parameter and there it is. Then we have the member init expression. So let's look for that. So express, not ex exception, expression init and we have member init. So that's pretty much it. And on here we see we need the new expression, which is going to be this bit right here. And then the bindings, which are going to be these right here. So let's create uh, the init expression. We'll have the new expression and uh, then we'll have the bindings. So let's create our body right here. And there we go. Now we just have to create the rest. I'm gonna slide this over here for a little bit more space and the new expression again. Let's just go to the expression, new. So that's a new expression. What do we need? If we take a look at it, we just need the constructor information. So we can uh, create our type B, which is going to be type of B. And then we can go to TB, uh, get constructor. And uh, if you've done this a couple of times, you know, there is going to be empty types, which basically gets you the parameterless constructor. So this is going to be our new expression. Let's, let me just copy the variable name here. Now for the bindings, uh, what we want to do is, uh, well, it is a list of member binding. So let's go ahead and create that a member binding. We'll call these bindings and a new list. Uh, I'm just going to call this new like this because I can't be bothered typing out again. But uh, there we go. We essentially want to create a bunch of these bindings for each of the properties. The properties are going to exist on a so we're going to go from one type to another if another type has more properties than the first one we're never going to be able to bind them because they're not on a so we only need to start from a to go into b so all possibilities of a those are the only ones that we can even hope of binding to b so let's grab type of a i can actually throw this over here so ta 
and let's apply this here. I'll create a for each loop where I'm gonna take a look at a property. I can call this prop to be maybe a little bit more descriptive and then uh, let's get properties. So this is gonna give me all the properties, which is gonna be ID and name. And uh, what I wanna do is go to expression and get the member binding. Okay, so the bind method, we have member information and then we have the expression. Member information is going to be the setter of the property. So we're going to pass the ID of the B into member information and then the expression is going to run in order to assign a value to that member. So here we will need our type B member. So I'm just gonna call it a TBM. And finally, we're gonna need an expression which is going to be this member access expression. So property MA. Uh, as in property member access expression for the property that we want to bind it to. So var tbm type b member. Again, we go to type b and we just get the property with the same name as the property, right? So super easy uh, if we fail to find it. So tbm will be null. In this case, we just continue. So if a has a property that doesn't exist on b, we're going to encounter this and we're just going to skip. Finally, uh, not saving this just yet, we want our member access. So we're gonna go to expression, we're gonna make member access. And here again, we have to supply an expression and member information. The member information, again, the property that we're accessing is going to come from the prop. And the expression right here, this is a typed parameter expression. This is actually going to be accessing it on this parameter, this parameter that we define right here. So we basically say that the parameter and let's call it param to be a little bit more descriptive. We'll just put it at the top here uh, somewhere. Uh, you could have moved about the lines a little bit, but basically from this parameter, we want to access one of these properties that it has. And because the parameter is going to be of the same type, I mean, it's just gonna work. So again, let me just get my IntelliSense back here. Uh, make member access the expression is going to be the parameter. So from this parameter, we want to go ahead and get this property. And this is going to be the property member accessor. Uh, finally, this is going to give us our binding and we just go ahead and add that to the bindings, just like that. And that's pretty much it. So here we're gonna have our Lambda expression. Uh, I'm just going to cut it short and we can compile it and then dynamically invoke it. I am going to cut this dump out, which was dumping this expression right here on the top. And I am going to supply a parameter into here. So let's say new a where ID will be one and name. I can name it as something it doesn't really matter what it is. And then finally, uh, the result, I'm going to dump that. Here it is, uh, the result, so <laughs> nothing too extreme. We get a conversion from A to B automatically. Uh, if we have additional property like uh, body, and on here, let's say uh, we have uh, a word or you know some kind of other expression that has this value that is essentially unreachable. As soon as we switch, to a property that exists on both uh, this automatically gets mapped from one to the other. This is essentially the functionality. Let's take a little bit further. Let's uh, put it in a class and uh, let's add some caching. Let's see what this looks like, right? So not that hashtag. We'll create a class and this is going to be a uh, mapper class. Um, well, <laughs> let's uh, stick it all in a function. Our parameters are essentially the type that we're taking in and uh, the type that we're giving out. And I'm just going to create a public, a static, some type that we're going to give out. So just T, I'm just going to call it two and the type that we're giving out, right? That's about it. Uh, I'm going to use object here because it's never going to know, like in, in Java, for example, if you have a a type uh, declaration, it's gonna automatically be able to infer that as the generic thing that you wanna convert to. Uh, in C Sharp, it doesn't work like that. So if I put uh, T in and T out here, uh, that's gonna make this method a little bit too verbose. So I'm not gonna do that. Let's just take all of it. I'm gonna skip the dump. And I'm, again, I'm just gonna dump it from the outside just so it's apparent where we're doing things. Uh, I'm gonna paste it into here. And uh, now I wanna, Oh, messing up uh, these uh, curly braces. 
I want to replace these types, right? I'm no longer just working with A and B. I'm being a little bit more dynamic. So I'll replace A with a thing that is coming in. So O get type instead of TA for type A, I'm going to call this the N type instead of B, we're going to use a T and this is going to be the out type. The rest of this pretty much stays the same. The object that we used to convert with, uh, we'll just return here. We'll supply the O and at the end, we're just going to perform a cast to our T. Maybe put it like this, but yeah, this doesn't matter in the end. It, it should always work <laughs> hypothetically. Uh, so we're going to go to mapper. We're going to go to two and we want to map to B from this object that I just copied, right? So let's run it again and well, pretty much the same result. Uh, let's just delete this to make sure it's still the same thing, right? Nothing's cached, at least not yet. Uh, so now we can move a little bit forward towards trying to cache this. So a very simple way to cache would be using a dictionary. So let's just create a static uh, dictionary where I'm just gonna use a tuple for type in and type out, which is going to map to the returning type which I will compile once. So whatever the compile method brings me back. So let's take a look at the Lambda expression. If ILSpy wants to open uh, on the Lambda expression, we want to take a look at the compile method and the type that is returned is delegate. So at the end, we are going to have delegate. Uh, this is going to be our cache. Let's just assign it to new. Same as the way that we've cleaned up and taken things out before. I'm just going to cut about yay much. I'm going to create a public uh, static delegate constructor. So create delegate. I know I made it uh, public. This could be private, right? Uh, outside logic doesn't really need to know any of this. I'm just going to create two uh, or pass in two types in type and type out type. Uh, well, no comma there. And at the end, we don't need to perform the conversion, right? We just one time to create the delegate and then we can cache it. So at this point, really everything should be apparent. So contains key, uh, the key is quite verbose to type out. So let's just go ahead and supply the in type here and out type. So if you don't know what this is, this is a tuple, uh, this is a struct. So this will stay on the stack, I think. Don't hold me to that. I have not gone and checked it, but if we contain a key, we want to return uh, and just to avoid some duplication, if we don't contain a key, that is one where I'm going to create a delegate with the in type, out type. I'm going to assign that to the cache, put that in there. And finally, once I actually have it in there, I can just go ahead and return dynamic invoke with the O and finally do the conversion to my T type. And there we go. Now we have caching. I can put a breakpoint here and because link path processes are kind of being retained. So first time it compiles, I will actually get go through the cache and then next time that it ex executes, it is actually going to skip it. So if I just put a breakpoint here, you will see that we're skipping it. Okay. So that's pretty much it on the implementation. Source code is available. Thank you very much for watching. Hopefully you enjoyed it. If you have any questions, do leave them in the comment section. Thank you very much to all of my patrons that are already supporting me. If you are not, do consider. It really helps out a lot. Hope you're all staying healthy out there. Have a good day.